right, everybody, if we want to get started to our August 22 general membership meeting. And as you walk through the doors, you traveled through time because it says it's 829, but we just made a mistake. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, okay, so first, um, I'd like to thank you all for, you know, taking the time to come tonight. And um, we'll go ahead and introduce our executive board members. Um, I am Jen Powell. I am the co-chair. We've got Melissa Hawthorne. She is the other co-chair. Uh, we've got Bobby Murmur. He is our new coordinator. Well, not so new anymore, but, you know, to some of you. Um, Adolfo, he's our treasurer. Uh, we got Pam Davis, or is it David? Pam? Paris, sorry. Okay, Pam Paris is our secretary. Uh, Sheila and Jason, um, they are our master of shenanigans over here. <laughs> and uh, Tyler Forrest is our new membership chair. Uh, talk to him if you need to get ca caught up on your membership dues. <laughs> All right, tonight um, we have some special guests here um, for our Renner's Rights Ordinance panel. Um, and we're going to be doing a Q&A, and Sheila is going to be moderating. So I'm going to pass it on to Sheila. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm going to pass out. Jason's going to give. Um, Jason's going to give a little history of it. So it started, I think, three years ago. Yeah, and I'm going to I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass. When? Okay. Well, no, I can hold this so they can use it. I'm going to pass out these photos that I happen to get from the city of Gainesville, just random inspections that they did this year. You'll see what the conditions. It's not the worst photos. They didn't seem to give those up. One of them showed half a house caved in with tarp over the roof, and I'm still trying to get that. But So I'm going to pass these out. So again, my name is Jason. Um, I've been in Gainesville since 08. Um, I've been active on this campaign, the self safe and healthy housing campaign for the past several years. Um, when we first started this campaign, um, I was a new homeowner. Um, I've been a renter most of my life. And I have personally experienced a lot of the things that we talk about with this ordinance. I've experienced rental deposit theft. I've experienced shoddy conditions high utility bills through no fault of my own. All the things we talk about in this ordinance are lived experience of people in this community that we talk to, all right? And so we started working on this, trying to get this passed at the city commission. We had some really fantastic partners at the city commission, particularly Adrian. He was really our champion on this issue. And we got it passed. Um, now we're trying to do something similar at the county level. Um, and I just want to say one last thing about this. We are here tonight to talk about ways that the city rollout has happened, could have happened better, is moving forward, and what lessons learned we can have for the county ordinance moving forward, all right? But the idea is we're not going back, okay? We've got this ordinance. We're going to get this ordinance at the county. We're going to protect renters in this community. So if you're one of those people that believe that the government just shouldn't be involved in housing, you want to move back the clock to where the government is involved in inspecting health care and inspecting food and inspecting all those things, you're at the wrong meeting, all right? We're going to get this ordinance passed, and we're going to make sure, and we're going to make sure that it's a good ordinance that does what it says it's going to do and protects renters in this community. So thank you. All right. So I... Uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists. Also, I want to say, during, especially during COVID, the Alachua County Labor Coalition probably has fielded, in the last two years, over 100 outreach, either email or phone calls about conditions of their housing or that they couldn't use the emergency rental assistance funds that they were able to get. After a lot of work, you have to send in a lot of stuff. And I really appreciate the city and county that they passed that immediately. The anti-discrimination housing part of the, this rental housing ordinance, where you can't discriminate because of source of income, familial status, whether you're veterans, check it out. Uh, I did bring um, the county's ordinance that they're proposing for this for the 
for the housing ordinance, the renter's right, we call it renter's rights. There's copies of it over there if you want to see it. They are, you know, there could be modifications. But the anti-discrimination has been a big win for this community. And there's outreach all over the state. They outreach to us to find out how they can pass it in their community. It's, it's been huge. So th thanks for that. So I want to introduce, um, and I did send them two pages of possible things they could talk about. <laughs> so, but I'd like y'all just to talk. Um, go ahead. Yeah, perfect. Uh -oh. Sorry, I also wanted to um, note that other supporters on the supporters of this ordinance on the Gainesville City Commission who helped us pass it, as well as supporters of the upcoming county ordinance were invited here. One did show up, so I did want to recognize him, Harvey. If you could stand out, this is Harvey Ward. So he was also a big help during during the camp the renters' rights ordinance campaign. Okay, so um, so Andrew Persons. That's right, right? Yep, that's right. Okay, so he's he does everything. <laughs> but officially, Office of... The reason we have to do this is for... This is being filmed, and we're going to upload it everywhere. Office of Sustainable Development. Adrian Hayes Santos is... Uh, he, he sponsored the rental, the rental housing ordinance and has been a city commissioner forever. And <laughs> grateful that it's ending, I'm sure. <laughs> So Greta, is it Moray? Moreau. Moreau. Um, we had a meeting. I, I would like to say, I always interrupt myself. We had multiple meetings with city and county commissioners three years ago get going in. We continue to have meetings. City commission had bi-weekly meetings when they were developing and let a lot of people, including a lot of landlords and their lobbyists come. And we're and now we're again meeting with the county commissioners. We met with Greta, who is, she is going to be directing the county inspection program. Is that? Under Harold <laughs> Horn, who, <laughs> but we met with her. She was hired to help get this program going. And not the, last but not least, Missy Daniels, acting assistant county manager, and the go-to person for everything at the county. We met with her three years ago. So thank you very much. Who want? Oh, gosh. Who start wants with the to start? <laughs> yeah, I guess we're going to go. I said I was giving you the question, so you didn't need a prompt. Oh. Okay, so, so, um, Commissioner Hay Santos and Mr. Persis, could you please talk about the process of developing the housing ordinance and implementation? Uh, sure. So um, it, it started off, I guess, like, I think three years ago. Um, it started off three years ago with the uh, working with ACLC, um, meeting uh, pretty often just on drafting, and, and then we had the the renters rights uh, subcommittee, which met for about a year, um, twice a week where we had people from landlords, uh, rental housing advocates, renters, pretty much everyone. I mean, we usually had around probably 25 to 30 people every single meeting. It was probably one of the most like um, engaged uh, public presentation I've, I've ever seen on the, at the city commission. Um, coming out of that, we were able to, not everyone agreed, but everyone had their voices heard. And I think that was an, that was an important part of it. Um, but we were able to get an ordinance that uh, I think is one of the, I would say it's the strongest uh, renters' rights ordinance in the Southeast United States, um, and it's focused on uh, providing that housing is, is safe and it's also uh, energy efficient. Um, we have a lot of subpar housing in our community and a lot of older housing stock um, that's that's not good. Um, like Jason, I've lived in that housing too, where like the floors are, you roll as you walk down the down the hallway, um, and other other issues like that. Um, so that's why it was important to me to make sure that we, and then there was actually a lot of fires were happening as well. Talking to Sheila, we had, we were getting fires in rental properties almost every week or two weeks to kind of during that period. So that was another kind of um, reason to push that forward. Uh, so that was kind of how it, it passed. It did pass unanimously um, from the city commission and it started in October of last year. Um, it only uh, is for units between one and four units. Uh, the state of Florida preempts us from regulating 
um, units are five or more. Unfortunately, we tried, but that's one of the preemptions they they put in. Um, there are some rolling portions of some of the energy efficiency things don't kick in for another five years. Is one to kind of we we tried to pick things that were the most cost to to benefit, um, and I think that's what we we were able to, to get to and then trying to get all experts on on that. Um, try to think we some of the issues that we ran into is one of the uh, with how we we outsourced our um, our inspections. Uh, that, that was kind of one of our early discussions, and we didn't we, we went this way. Um, it didn't work out. I'd probably let uh, Mr. Persons kind of touch on kind of the issues that we had, um, and then where we're we, we've actually made some changes to that, and are, are changing that and rolling them out shortly too. Sorry, there's we actually need to switch mics. Oh, okay. no problem. Um, yeah, so I can talk a little bit about implementation. I um, unfortunately wasn't. Um, um, really involved in, in a lot of the ordinance drafting or the work of the rental subcommittee. Um, although I was at the city at the time, I didn't have code enforcement uh, as part of my charge. Um, so I could you know see it happening, but, but, um, but I wasn't uh, attending a lot of those meetings. Fast forward, the, um, I did get involved right at the tail end of the ordinance um, during the, uh, the adoption, and then was very involved in the actual implementation. So I think the commission adopted it, uh, adopted the ordinance in September the previous year of 2020 um, with a, uh, an effective date when we would actually start doing inspections the following year in October. And so we roughly had about a year or so to actually build out the program, um, both from the permitting side and then from the actual inspection side. Um, so there was a, there was a lot of work uh, up front um, both in terms of, uh, first we needed to sort of get an idea of how many potential regulated units that we had. We needed to do a lot of, um, uh, you know, plug in some additional sort of outreach and discussion. We needed to actually build a permit program um, out of that. Luckily or unluckily, depending on, uh, on if you uh, talk to our code enforcement staff and Greta was on that, we were also um, uh, moving forward with a new uh, permitting online permitting system that um, that the county uses as well. Um, so we're building that out at the, at the same time. Um, as the commissioner said, uh, we had worked uh, like my staff had worked really on the permitting side, setting it up um, so so people could do online permitting and whatnot. Um, that we felt really great about. Um, the city decided the previous city manager had made a decision that um, for the actual inspections. Um, side of it, rather than uh, hire internal, uh, hire city staff to do the inspections, which had been, I think, uh, what we were sort of moving towards, um, the, there was a decision to basically go out and outsource that. So this, uh, that was outsourced to, um, to a company called Cap Government. They, they're a, um, a private inspection, like building inspection service that works primarily out of South Florida doing inspections for, um, for local governments on, on building permit side. Um, so we had, uh, we, so we had cap, um, as, as, uh, that we ran into quite a few issues primarily with the way that they were able to service the inspections by using, um, a, a qualified, uh, inspector on the other side of, um, a virtual inspection using UF engineering students. So you can imagine, um, we had quite a bit of issues with uh, consistency, both of the, the, um, the consistency of the students' inspections or their work, um, primarily because you know, they were being trained very quickly by the, by the vendor. Um, I think at, at one point, all of the students that we had working in the field had contracted COVID all at once, so we were down for that. Um, students uh, have different schedules, and so we were really kind of having to work around student schedules oftentimes with like with uh, inspections happening two weeks in advance. There was some communications um, issues between the vendor and the property owners who were having the inspections in terms of communication, so there was some you know, issues where um, owners uh, were saying, well, we didn't get notified before the inspection showed up. So needless to say, all of these things were going on um, uh, with, uh, as we were doing implementation on the inspection side. I can tell you it drove my code enforcement staff nuts because they were like, we're, like, we're, we're um, not providing the level of service that we're accustomed to providing. 
we um, there was a loss of of um, uh, of, of control basically because we were not the ones in the in the houses doing the inspections um, it caused us on the city side on the staff side and and, uh, um, and Greta can attest to this so we we actually look at every single inspection that cap did in terms of we actually went back and did a re-review of the inspection pictures and the results because we didn't have a level of comfort with the, with the work that was being done in the field. So we didn't want to send out any notices um, of deficiencies until we had a chance to actually look at it. So all of those things being said, that was a big lesson for us. Um, luckily, we were able to come to the commission, city commission earlier this year, provide an update on status and ask for the commission to okay ending the contract with CAP and then um, authorizing us to hire in-house uh, inspectors to actually do the inspection. So we're actually in that process right now um, about to, uh, we actually are already doing some of the re-inspections in-house using in-house staff that we're currently hiring and training. Um, so that, that's, been a, um, that's been a big improvement, I think, both in terms of communication uh, and consistency moving forward. Cool. So um, I'm jumping now to question 10 so that the county staff could have an opportunity to talk and then we'll keep going back and forth. So um, when we met with y'all, so I saw your presentation, Missy. Do y'all mind if I use your first name? No, of course not. I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we met with you, so I saw the presentation you gave. It was a great PowerPoint. We have a couple of copies. Oh, cool. So if you want to talk about any of that, like stuff y'all learned from the city, how you're doing it. So basically, can you explain your timeline and the t potential number of homes to be licensed and inspected and how will you make sure landlords sign up and what will be the process of contacting landlords for inspections? Um, part of it is what was... So the Sun did a big article that accidentally got published before they were prepared to do it. So there's been a lot of work, outreach in the Sun and also city and county to reassure and to get the facts. Like I want to talk to Mr. Persons before I, you know, went to the Sun and stuff. And part, part of it was um, the contacting the landlords and them. So could you all explain like what your process is going to be? And I assume the city's has been similar too. Yeah. And then just what, like highlight your PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Sure. Sure. Well, I'll start kind of where we started because we had the benefit of all the work that you guys and the city of Gainesville had already done. Sorry. Um, so Andrew can tell you, I bugged them for the first year, met with them all the time. How's it going? How's it going? And they're like, ah, very graciously talked to me, but you could tell they were so busy with it. They need to be doing that. Um, we had that benefit. So the county commission decided they wanted to explore it. So they asked us to present to them what the city was doing. So we did that we learned what they were doing um this was probably before it was before you started inspections about when you were getting ready to adopt it and then the county commission said great we want to do the same thing we want it to be very very similar so landlords across the county and city limits line aren't confused and we want to take this out to all the small cities and see if they want to join in with us and the county all of our ordinances that could be effective countywide, may have an opt-in or an opt-out for the small cities so they can be joined in. So we did. We went to all the cities. None of them wanted to opt-in to begin with. They had varying levels of thinking, oh, it might be a good idea, it might be too expensive, and they wanted to watch and see how it went in Gainesville and with the county. But some of them are very interested and want to see how it goes and, and may join in. So we may get some of the outlying areas too. Um, I don't know if I have those numbers. I don't think I brought those tonight, but you know, the, the number of units that we're estimating in the outlying cities are much smaller than Gainesville, of course, has the most in the county, the unincorporated part of the county next, and then depending on the size of the cities. But um, 
So we did that. We came back to the county, and by this time, the city was doing their inspections and starting to run into a few issues. So the county kind of didn't back off, but they said, let's watch and see how it's going so that we, when we step into this, we get it right. So we watched for a while, so it slowed us down. Um, I found an old presentation, one that we did, and one of the directions from the county commission was get the program going in March of 2021, I think, <laughs> uh, which would have been extremely fast because we had just presented to them a few months before. But right now we're going back to the commission on September 13th with a public hearing. And the timeline for that would be um, some of it, and I'll walk through this, some of the ordinance would go into effect right away. The energy efficiency standards would be put out. I can't remember all the things you wanted me to talk about, but do you want me just to walk through our yeah, ordinance? Yeah, that would be great. Now? Okay. So in the beginning, we were doing it exactly like the city ordinance where um, the county is updating their property maintenance code uh, the one that we're acting under right now, working under, is very old. So on the 13th, also, the first public hearing will be to update that property maintenance code. We apply that today to all properties, but it's on a complaint basis. All of our code enforcement is really on a complaint basis in the county. So um, we stay busy. Our minimum housing staff stays busy, but they're not getting nearly the number of units inspected that would need to be. So the ordinance, that part will be updated, My and then this ordinance like will what? incorporate the new property maintenance code, housing and maintenance code is what it's called, and that will go into effect right away. Immediately, let's say the county commission adopts this on the 13th with no changes, then it would go into effect that night, the following day. Any complaints that come in would be under that new code, but the inspection part won't start until next October. So it gives us a year to roll out the program to get our landlords licensed and on board. So the way the ordinance is written is they have to have their license no later than September 30th of 2023. Two, three. Correct. <laughs> We're in 22, yeah. sorry. <laughs> so a year from now. Um, and part of that is we couldn't start doing, we don't have the staff. We need to hire code enforcement staff, but we can't hire them until we know the program's adopted. It's not adopted yet. We need to know that it's going to happen and going to be adopted. We can hire the staff, begin training them. We're going to do the initial rollout with Greta and use other staff to get the licensing going. And hopefully, you know, it's a tough market to hire, but hopefully we can get all the code enforcement staff on board and ready to go and trained by the drop date of October 1, 2023 to start their inspections. Again, that will be for the pro, um, housing and maintenance code that's being updated. And I have a checklist here if you want to hear the, di the difference between that and the energy efficiency. It's in the ordinance, too, that she has a copy of. So originally, the energy efficiency standards mimicked the cities. The standards themselves do mimic the cities, but the timeline mimicked the cities as well, just with a year or two difference because we were behind them. Um, some of the standards going into effect right away, some of them higher standards pushed out the five years. As our timeline went on and the county commission didn't adopt an ordinance, we went back to the county commission in June and said, okay, here's, here's what they wanted an update again on what happened was going on with the city of Gainesville because they'd heard they were going to start doing in-house. County commission had already decided to do in-house, but they wanted to hear what tweaks they were making, what, what things to consider in the ordinance. So we brought them that update, and we proposed that the housing and maintenance standards in themselves in a proactive way that we could go enforce them by getting the landlord, landlord licenses done, have inspectors out there inspecting those units for all of those standards rather than just on the complaint basis we have now would go really, really far in addressing issues with rental housing. And to let us get the program going with that because the inspectors we already have on staff are familiar with those standards, even though we're updating it, a lot of them are the same as what we're under now. They can help train the new staff and go for the energy efficiency standards instead of having the two tiers 
where you have one tier now and in five years you change or three years, we're going all the way to the second one. And we have that set for October of 2026. So three years from now. So this first year again, we'll be getting license, getting people licensed. We'll open up our licensing in January is our hope if the commission goes ahead and adopts in September because then we're going to start sending out letters right away to all the landlords. And I know Sheila wanted us to talk about how we're going to reach those landlords. Um, and then we'll open our licensing in January. You know, will people start coming in then? I hope so. Um, we don't have as many staff as the city had, and I know they had to bring in some staff to help process those. So we're hoping to keep it online with our citizen service system. We've done licensing before. We've never done landlord licensing. So, you know, the city had some form of landlord licensing already. We don't. It's another reason that we're taking this first full year to make sure we can get that part of the program going. And education. We're going to do the education now throughout this year to have Zoom meetings, webinars, in-person meetings for landlord groups and different groups around town that want them. Um, probably do some videos, so things like this, to get the, the word out there that it's now going to be in the unincorporated area. How She asked a lot of questions. How we're going to reach the <laughs> landlords. <laughs> <laughs> um, the only way that we can do that right now is to take all of the homes, and we're also doing the, the one to four units, four units and under is what we're regulating, just like the city. Anything that's not homesteaded, we're going to send you a letter up front, and we're going to put you in our system. So it'll be incumbent on you to tell us, no, I just didn't get my homestead, I live there, or... Nobody's renting it. The place is vacant. I don't need a license, that kind of thing. And we'll work on that for this next year when we hear back from people. Right now, and this number changed within a couple of months from when we went, so we'll update these numbers again. But as of right now, and this probably actually was from June, there are 11,243, well, we're saying rental units, but we mean non-homesteaded property out there, anything from mobile home to a quadruplex. Um, 8,574 separate property owners. So right there, I think that's about half of what you guys mm -hmm. started with. And I doubt all 8,000 of them are actually landlords, but that's who will get the initial letters we'll send them hey come to our information session and then we'll follow that up with how to get their license and then once the time ticks we won't be able to enforce them not having it until that october one date but then we'll start going out you know we're hoping we're going to encourage people to go ahead and get their license beat the rush they won't have to renew it in october it'll be good from now until the following the 2024 so um, that's how we're going to reach them. Um, I don't know if you want the breakdown of units, but one thing different than us is we have a lot more mobile homes that are rented than the city does. So that's one thing that we've, we've looked at, um, the different standards in the energy efficiency. Some of them you can't meet in a mobile home. So we may end up right now, you can just get a hardship or attic insulation, for instance, we're not going to obviously enforce that on mobile homes, so we'll just write that off. We may end up creating standards that are different in the end if we think that we need to. But for now, that's how our ordinance is set up. What did I not answer? Well, I'll just ask a general question. So... Um, and y'all can jump in on each other, too. <laughs> I hear on NPR when they try to do it, it never works. But <laughs> So here's some of the stuff that the article in the Gainesville Sun, which was, you know, I'm not faulting them because uh, they have had a lot of turnover, but this is just some stuff that came up. So... Some opponents of the renter's rights ordinance complain that many of its requirements are ornamental, like the peeling paint and the, and the grass. And the, the thing is, what they've said to the Labor Coalition 
for three years is they can call in the renters, but they're afraid to. That, that's what we get over and over, and they get evicted when they call in. That's why it had to be a random, the city is doing this. So could you talk about like the universal code, um, any of you all, and um, the stuff that they say like chipping paint is just ornamental and the, the you know, I have, I pulled up some of the stuff that's going before the magistrate. If we have time, I'm gonna read some of those that people were cited for. Um, and, and could you talk about the electrical outlets and things like that, like the report that you gave, you said what the majority of the infractions were, right. but that majority doesn't mean the worst. Right. I mean, there's like really severe, you know, like Adrian said, we started this because there was fires happening in people's homes. Yeah, and I, and I, I just um, think like I mentioned, so we've, we, looked at basically I think every every Tuesday morning we would go through you know a, a big list of inspections look at all the pictures um, so we've we've like even though the city had um, contracted out the inspection side we have looked at essentially every you know the interior every uh, unit that's been inspected um, the uh, on um, to, to Sheila's question, so the city, um, probably similar to the county, although I'm not sure if you guys were, we, um, a part of the rental ordinance that was adopted um, back in uh, 2020, we updated our, um, the city also had a minimum housing code um, that had been homegrown and had been not updated in, in quite a long time. And uh, there was a desire to both from city staff and from the commission to um, to standardize that. There were several gaps that we had in our old housing code that um, because like most things, this the, it's not something that the city had updated sort of on a, on a frequent or regular basis. So we adopted the International Code Council um, uh, International Property Maintenance Code. We, um, we have the Florida Building Code is actually based on the ICC um, uh, code, the International Building Code. Um, and so this is basically a subset uh, or a, um, uh, something that's, that's promulgated from the International uh, Code Council for specifically for property maintenance. And so it covers all the things that fall under minimum housing code, um, both interior and exterior. Um, what we've found with the inspections that um, the city's done, and we've done I think to date about um, uh, almost 800 in actual inspections of, of, uh, of units. Those are between the first inspection and second inspection. Um, the vast majority of, or the, 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 the um, out of the minimum housing code um, categories, the things that we see most frequently are uh, missing or broken smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors, um, fire extinguishers that are either missing not charged or not functional um, uh, outlets, electrical outlets that are either wired incorrectly or are uh, non-functional. Um, and then the then sort of peeling paint, uh, but it's not just peeling paint, it's basically the exterior of, of, the, uh, of the unit. It may be rotting fascia, rotting soffit, um, rotting um, cladding on the, on the building, it may be substantial areas. Um, of where, where paint is deteriorated. Paint is a um, part of the building envelope. It prevents moisture intrusion. It prevents uh, infestation of um, termites and other wood destroying organisms. So it is part of the city's um, uh, uh, maintenance code um, that we have. Uh, I will say um, some of the, we've, we've seen some really bad examples or we've seen some really bad units um, oftentimes some of the, um, we have in some instances um, had to take immediate action because there would be, um, we've inspected units where there was unpermitted work um, done with a, a gas water heater right next to an electrical panel, um, which is of course a no-no, um, but it was done, you know, um, without, uh, without permits oftentimes. And so those are examples 
Um, we've seen some some pretty pretty rough um, uh, rough units. I'm sure Sheila probably has some of the some of the pictures. Um, Great photos. Um, most of what we've seen in terms of the energy efficiency standards, um, we've seen um, uh, a lot of units with inadequate uh, uh, insulation to meet the R19 standard in the city's uh, ordinance. Uh, we've seen some some small things um, that are that are just repeat issues where there may be uh, an attic access that's missing weather stripping or an attic access maybe missing the R30 um, backing insulation um, that's required by code. Um, those are some things um, as well as um, water heater pipes. Uh, the, uh, the water heater pipes have to be insulated. That's a very common thing. Um, one of the things that we're doing with the city taking over inspection is gonna be actually stocking the code inspectors vehicles with some of those common, uh, uh, common uh, violations so that when we go and do an inspection, you better bet there's not gonna be missing attic, um, uh, uh, attic uh, weather stripping because that's something that's easy to carry. We can actually provide that uh, to the owner or to the tenant. Um, so it can be something that we, rather than issue, you know, a letter with that being a violation, we can simply correct that as we're doing the inspections that we can do in-house. Um, some of the other common energy uh, um, issues that we've seen are um, the uh, issues with uh, the 2.2 gallons per minute uh, for sinks and faucet um, and shower heads. Um, but the the the, uh, the majority of those are are some of the ones that I mentioned in terms of energy efficiency, and then the minimum housing code have been um, primarily things that you would associate with uh, with minimum housing standards and life safety. Um, yep. Cool. And there's been some some pretty pretty bad examples. Too. Yeah, that's what I what wanted to hear to about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is for any of you all, and I I do want to emphasize. The, you could go to the ACLC website and see what we asked for. Jason, who's on the, the advisory board for, what is it called? Yeah. Um, no, the advisory board. Utilities advisory board helped develop it. And he's been involved with the Community Weatherization Coalition for a long time. We asked for high efficiency toilets and insulation. That was the cheapest thing that would give the most bang for the buck. And frankly, the Community Weatherization Coalition can do the rest, really. I mean, they do it every day. It's for renters, homeowners, anyone. And so for people like some of the comments that the landlords were saying about, uh, it's like, you don't even have to do it. You can get the CWC to do it. It doesn't even cost very much. So, um, okay, so I, I must, I'm very interested because I've seen horrible housing. Mold was a big issue. Greta let me know that mold is not something code can do anything about. They look for the source. That was an eye opener. But um, the ordinance mandates insulation could you talk about the importance of the insulation with, especially now with the high GRU, any, anyone can take this up, and the water efficiency requirements? Uh, why are these standards important and why, especially in this community where we're trying to help people with their water bills? And then if somebody wants to jump in, well, I'll ask that question after, like what are the resources? Because we know there's a lot of them out there for people to get help. Yeah, so on the insulation, um Insulation, I don't, so Florida didn't really have a clear building code until the 1990s coming out of um, Hurricane uh, Andrew. So before that, it was a mismatch of building standards across the state of Florida. And um, insulation, I think R30 was, or wasn't even, R, wasn't even required before that? Or, yeah, so before the 1990s, it wasn't even required to have insulation in your, in your home in the attics. Um, People did it, but a lot of it just wasn't required. So you have a lot, we have a lot of our housing units that are uh, rented that are built before 1990s. So a lot of them don't have insulation. And that really is the number one thing you can do to reduce your energy. Um, you put your hand on a place that's not insulated, it's hot to your touch during the middle of the day. And it's, it's cheap. Um, 
I, I got uh, insulation, blown insulation done my place, and it was $500 for, I think, a, a thousand square feet. It's not an expensive thing. And that's one of the things that I've, I've heard, you hear from some landlords that like, oh, it's going to cost me thousands and thousands of dollars to fix my place. It costs $500 to put in um, insulation. Uh, a new toilet, you can buy an energy efficiency toilet from Lowe's, 100 bucks. It costs about $150 to get hey, it installed from a plumber. That's $250. Oh, okay. So a two-bedroom or two-bathroom place, you're looking at maybe $1,000 with the fixed-up stuff that you, would have, you, like you wouldn't have to know beforehand, but it would make a huge difference in the utility bills. People are saying they're having to spend thousands and thousands of dollars. No, okay. Have okay. slum housing. Okay. They have housing that okay. has Bye. significant issues. Um, there are holes in the walls or whatever it might be. The, the issues you're talking about the electrical panels or those things like that. So if you're hearing someone say they have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars, their place already did not meet the current standards. Um, it really should only cost around thousand dollars day around that to, to bring it up to, um, to, uh, to code. And just one other thing. So we're doing inspections every, uh, every, every year, uh, or every, every four years, a place will be inspected. And then every eight years, it'll be inspected for a be given an energy efficiency score. The reason for that every eight years is it, your house doesn't really change that much in terms of energy efficiency, but you're also given a, uh, a score too that has to be given to the tenant before they sign a lease. So this allows people to, they're looking at two different places. They're both, I don't know, they're both $800 a month or $1,000 a month for that, for that unit. And they may have very drastic GRU bills. But this allows um, a tenant to be able to look at that and say, well, this one's much more energy efficient versus this one, so they can make that decision and also drive landlords to make their places more energy efficient so they get higher scores, so they can kind of make their place more um, kind of valuable to the public as well. Uh, I don't know. Do you all want that? We did actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we actually did. We won a uh, Department of Energy uh, Innovation Award for the, uh, for the ordinance and um, that was, uh, uh, the staff was really proud of that, yeah. And I, I think to, uh, to add to uh, uh, Commissioner A. Santo's point, uh, one of the benefits that, that we can see um, on the staff side of this is that we are going to be, uh, we're in the process of building a very rich data set of rental property in the city of Gainesville. We have, um, to, uh, to Missy's um, point, we originally estimated that we have about 15,000 regulated uh, units that are well, between one and, and four units in the city. Um, through the work that we've done with the initial year, that number has been uh, winnowed down to about seven or 8,000 units that actually have permits um, in the city. And so that's going to be sort of moving forward what we're really kind of working with in terms of a constellation of, of units. Over time, as we do these inspections on a yearly basis, um, we expect that we'll have a full sort of data set of regulated units, including uh, DOE energy scores. One thing that we're going to be doing is actually working on uh, publishing that data. Right now, you can access all of that data with our online portal, um, but we're actually going to be publishing that data in an interactive map that you're actually gonna be able to see all those regulated units on a map, zoom in, click on a unit, find out the uh, energy score, look at the last results of the inspection. So we see that as not just a tool for, um, uh, for us, but also one for the, for the public um, or potentially renters. They can be able to look up that energy score um, before they rent uh, or, or use that information, I think, in other, other avenues. So. Okay, so um, so Greta or Missy, I want Greta to talk, and I'm I'm not sure. Did I? Sorry, I don't usually take phone calls, but there were some people who said they were coming, and so I'm like saying, "Are you coming?" Um, that I wanted to hear this in the county. Um, so, did I introduce you, Mr. Horn, Harold Horn? He's the code administration manager, and um, so can. Can you all talk about why is the county giving till 2026 since we're talking about the uh, utility efficiency standards? Not just, not judgmental, but I just want to go on the record. And, and do you all want to talk about like what programs? I know GRU has the LEAP program. I know the county has set aside money. I don't know if you all know those figures or if you could hazard a, a guess. So I will answer the first part of um, Sheila's question. Um, 
So not just to kind of give you some information on my background, because uh, I am wearing a Lachua County shirt. So I am currently employed with the county, and Andrew's <laughs> mentioned me several times. I recently retired from the city of Gainesville for 25 years with code enforcement. Yay. I wasn't with code enforcement for 25. I was with the police department for 19 half, but I did five and a half. So um, I retired as a supervisor. So I was part of the initial beginning phase with the city of the rental housing. Uh, so when I retired and I called the county, they were like, oh, we got the perfect job for you. <laughs> so um, here I am. I am the one and only employee right now that's under the rental housing. That was a lot of the decision process that we made, giving us ourselves the time that we felt we needed for our program to roll out correctly. And um, so the city already had a program. It was on a much smaller scale, but at least they had some experience. They had some database. Um, we're starting from scratch, literally. Now, we are, uh, we're also going with International Property Maintenance Code, as Missy suggested. So the county and the city are going to have the same uh, minimum housing standards, which is great. Um, we are... Um, so with a rollout of waiting for a couple years, um, it's going to give us the opportunity to hire the staff that we need. And again, we're not going to have, in the beginning, we probably will not have the amount of staff that the city certainly has. They already had some staff on board, and they've added since then. Um, we, we're very hopeful in the future, but we still have some staff we're going to hire in the next few months. Along with the staff, we need to train them. And there's equipment that's needed in order to get them properly ready to be able to take this on. Um, that helped with some of the process so that we make sure that we're ready and we're rolling this out correctly. Um, I will say this, um, being part of the city as many years as I was and now being with the county, um, the staff at both of the agencies, and I mean this wholeheartedly, are very passionate about what they do in code enforcement. They love their job, they love their community, and they want to do the job to the best of their ability. So with the city taking back from CAP, it's going to be the, probably the best decision that they've made because yeah. the staff will make sure this is done correctly. And my hope, and Harold and Missy's, of course, is that the county follows through with that as well, and we roll it out just as, just as well. So... Um, with that, I will take it back. Did I answer your question? Oh, yeah, that was great. Do you, <laughs> <laughs> does anyone want to talk about all the programs? Because a, a lot of the landlords say that they, you know, this is going to cost me a fortune. You know, I'm going to pass on the rate of the increase for me to get my house up to code. I mean, these are state sta standards. It's not anything new. And... I just want a little editorial, the narrative that you're not going to keep it, I'm not going to keep it affordable if I have to bring my house up to code. And we're talking, you know, falling down stuff. So you think that low-income people should live in filth and degradation? Harold, do you want to talk about? Yeah, I started doing minimum housing. 1976 in Broward County, and I was a combination one and two family inspector, so you, you were doing those. And uh, some of the first community development block grants were coming out, and we were starting a housing program in our community development department. I worked for the county building department, and so we started a joint effort, and gradually I moved over into that. Uh, at that point, in doing minimum housing, I was coming across things that surprised me to see it in America. Uh, people lacking drinking water, uh, sewage being exposed, particularly in former labor camps, uh, farm labor camps and things. All the stuff that Edward R. Merrill showed in 1956 was still there in 76. And, and so you had, uh, it's easy to get passionate about doing something when you think there's a purpose and you're doing it. Later, I was doing redevelopment, and I was working in areas that had declining property values, and they were low-income rental units. And I wrote the first rental property code. Uh, I think I, I wrote the first draft around 87, 
I probably got it passed in 91. Landlords objected constantly. Mm -hmm. And what I did was something I heard in what Andrew was saying about the, uh, uh, about smoke alarms and carbon detectors. Uh, at that time, I had fire prevention under me too. And so since I had fire inspectors, and we were actually keeping up with it, and, uh, and they were anything over three units, they were doing inspections for that. So when I wrote the code, I just trained them in code enforcement. I said, now turn your hat around, and now you're a code enforcement officer, and take a look at that unit and see if it's meeting these standards. We only charged $10 a unit, and I still had landlords saying I had my hand in their pocket. Yeah. <laughs> All I was trying to do was to build the database that he was just talking about. Because instead of responding to when I have a complaint, now I have a proactive method in which I can go out and assess what's going on in the community. And we are still trying to get that on board up here. Because by targeting certain areas, there are communities in this county right now that I find the same water conditions that I was talking about 50 years ago. Wow. And, it, and some of them has been identified in this county for 50 years and hasn't been repaired. So we're making some efforts to do that because by taking a model area and really applying the code, you see the improvement. If all I do is send people out to respond to complaints, right. eventually they're going to get discouraged because they can't look at the benefit of what they've done. They're like a dog chasing their tail. It's just a constant every day going out and doing it, but you can't focus on it. And what I had the benefit of when I did my rental property was it was a smaller city. So my bad landlords got out of there and better people bought the property. And I went from having declining property values to having the second highest increase in property wow. values, not counting new construction. So it, it, can, it can be a very effective way of going. And somebody, um, Jason and I had spoken on the phone the other day. Um, we have an interest with CWC. And I, what I hope to do is send code officers through their program and do a cooperative thing where we're doing their type of inspections. Maybe we can get the county to kick in some money to them to give them more things that they can hand out so that we, as uh, was said, solve the problem as we leave it. Because my definition of a code officer if you look at Florida 162, it says that a code officer is somebody that a municipal government or a county government designated to be a code officer. That's all it says. But my definition is a code enforcement officer is someone that has a knowledge of a particular body of law and, and is an expert at applying that to solve community problems. So you've got to go out there with the intent of solving those problems. And if you give that, empowerment to the person doing the job, you'll see a lot of responsible people out there doing it. Yay, thank you. I'm glad you came also. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so what, what kind of help is there um, out there? Well, landlords, I know when we started meeting, those subcommittee meetings, um, we were told, GRU told us that they always had, they had rebates for years for landlords to upgrade things like appliances. And they had one person in three years, one landlord do it. So can you say like, what kind of, how much is out there? Yeah, so I, Commissioner Ward might be, I, we allocated 2.9 or 1.9 million of ARPA funds, 1.9, say so 1.9 million dollars in ARPA funds uh, for housing rehabilitation. Um, that's not just for rental, but we did expand some of our programs, a GRU LEAP program for, for renters as well. Um, so there are significant uh, amount of dollars and the LEAP program has increased. I think we've doubled or tripled the number of, uh, of housing units a year that we can now see, which I think was around so it's probably gonna be like a thousand units a year. I think we might be able to uh, to help in putting in new um, HVAC, and then we actually opened it up to people who expanded eligibility. Yeah, expanded eligibility than was there before. Um, I'm trying to think, do we have any other? For the CWC, um, we 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 fund the CWC with with a 
I don't know, a few hundred thousand dollars a year, I think, of, uh, of dollars to help. And that's getting out there doing the um, helping people with their energy efficiency in, in both renter, commercial, and, and homeowners as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you think of any other. We, I mean, we have some of our traditional housing programs um, through SHIP and CDBG with uh, home repair and renovation. Oh, yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> you got to promote it. Too. Yeah. I know. I can't keep up. I, know, I, I know. chasing me, him me around either. the city me trying either. to contact him. But yeah, well, we do have some of the traditional um, housing programs. Uh, we have a, um, uh, we're working right now with some um, home uh, American Rescue Plan uh, work that will open up some emergency um, uh, roof replacement uh, money when that comes. Uh, so we are we're, we have some of the traditional programs too that are not technically energy efficiency, but all all go to the overall building envelope. Yeah. So the county has a lot of the traditional programs as well in our housing program. We did put um, ARPA money, American Rescue Plan money, into rehabilitation. A lot of that that the housing department is doing now is homeowners, not rental. So we are starting a grant program. There's right now the pilot is going to have three million in it, and it's for rental land or for landlords to take advantage of to do certain energy efficiency upgrades. A lot of them that would meet the minimum housing standards that that we'll be adopting. There's a catch, though. If the landlords take part and get that money, um, they can get anywhere between, say, 5000 and 15000 They have to guarantee that the home is going to stay affordable, and it has to stay affordable to um, someone earning 50% of the AMI. So... I can tell you, and there's a, it's a area median income. I'm sorry, area median income. So 50% is that that's targeting lower than most housing programs target. But um, with that program, so this is going to be coming back to the county commission soon to award where we went out for bid to have someone run it for us. But you, if you get up to 5,000, you have to keep the house affordable for three years. Anywhere between five and ten thousand, it's five years, and ten thousand to fifteen thousand is seven years. So we're going to start with a pilot program, like I said, in a couple of different areas, and then if that works, um, you know, the county now has an affordable housing trust fund that's not super funded yet, but is getting funded. Some of the American Rescue Plan dollars can go into there, and then once all this starts going, the funding will just increase in there. So that. We'll be able to we'll be able to expand it some more. I think the pilot program is probably going to hit about fifty homes to begin with in a few different areas, maybe one small city, and then a couple of areas in the county, and then we'll see how that goes. Um, and the pilot's going to be a pretty short pilot, so that we can get the whole program rolled out really quickly if we find that it's successful. Um, that's probably our biggest area for, you know, it doesn't help all the landlords if they're not going to guarantee that it's affordable, but. So I'm going to do a couple of them together. Um, so one of the things people said was, okay, I'll just say it. Do inspections, do the inspections themselves cost money or is that covered under the landlord license, license costs? I would like you to say whether double pane windows are in the ordinance for energy efficiency because that's always brought up. And then um, one thing we saw during those meetings, no one believed that people who lived in a 1,000 or 800 square foot unit that there were, this was before the rates increased, were having $800 bills. So we so they directed staff to come back with hot spots. Georgetown Manor on 16th Avenue and 13th Street, they had the highest electrical, the, the highest utility bills in the whole city. And that's just because it's so poorly constructed. So can you all talk about the cost of the, sorry, I digress. Can you talk about the cost of the um, licensing fees? And does that cover the cost of inspections? And then 
if they reinspect, we talked about how right. if they meet the requirements after that's waived. That's right. Well, so with the city's, uh, the current fee for the city's, uh, um, rental inspection or uh, permit is $140 uh, per unit. Um, that includes the, um, the, the, the first inspection is part of that $140. If that first inspection um, uh, results in, a, in, in deficiencies in standards, um, the city will have the uh, ability to assess a hundred dollar reinspection fee. That is, again, a cost um, to uh, to go out and to service that. But what we're going to be doing is um, offering the ability for the um, for the deficiencies for them to send pictures or other types of of evidence that the uh, repair has been made. And if we deem that. Um, that has been made, we won't uh, charge that that hundred dollar reinspection fee, um, and so we're trying to save um, um, save folks a little bit of money on that um, that piece. What was your other question, Sheila? The windows. Oh, the windows. Yeah, and double pane windows are not part of the ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> That's just why yeah. I'm so. The windows sick. have to be work. You have to have working windows, right. um, and they can't holes in them and, and things like that. Right. Yeah. Which which we have, uh, some of our inspections have turned out non-functioning windows, um, some windows with, bro with broken panes or other issues, missing screens, some of those types of things that we're addressing with minimum housing. So do, do you all know yet, does the county know yet how much you're gonna be charging? Um, we don't, we're calculating that now. Um, we're probably gonna propose something to the county commission pretty close to what the city has and then have a reinspection fee as well because you can't cover your cost and then you don't, certainly don't wanna penalize the landlord that has it perfect the first time and average that in. So we're, we're looking at it and trying to figure out what that cost would be so that the license will cover the program but not be so onerous that it is really an issue. So, you, sorry, so we move on to the audience Q and A. Just so yeah, just I have one more. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so the last thing that is always continually brought up: some ordinance opponents claim it has led landlords to take housing units out of the rental stock. Um, do you want to address? You know, the landlords say, "Well, I'll, I'll just sell then, and you won't have any." Does anyone want to? I would say if you if if you're going to sell because you don't want to have your house safe and healthy, then you shouldn't be a landlord. Um, and that's, it's same thing like for food inspection. If you want to have a restaurant, you don't want your place to have be inspected for food. I mean, then you probably shouldn't run. It's a I mean, being a landlord is a business, and I think it should be treated like that, so that you you're providing a service to the renter and they're getting something back. And I think that's why that's why we're being able to regulate it too, because it is a business. Um, so that's, that's the biggest thing to that. Um, I think housing prices have increased dramatically, um, not only here, but across the country. People are selling. Um, and I think to, um, to your point earlier that there are landlords who shouldn't be landlords and they, this probably will force them out of, they, they, they don't wanna deal with this. They don't wanna have to actually provide ho safe housing. So they'll get out and somebody else will buy it and that person will provide a better place for people to live. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so I guess we'll, um, before I forget, please write a letter of support the Board of County Commissioners um, to, if you support this ordinance, we have a lot of groups that have written letters and a lot of people. Um, so does anyone have a question you want to ask the panel? Danny? Oh, yeah. Um, kind of to Commissioner Hey Santos and also to Mr. Person, um, based on some things you were saying, but you're mentioning about the energy efficiency scores that landlords need to provide uh, individuals like a, prior to signing a lease or whatever that is. Um, it was curious, this came up in another meeting I was in a couple weeks ago where this got brought up and someone was like, hey, I just signed a lease and they didn't give me one. And so curious what recourse people have. So a lot of people might really not know their rights under this. Uh, ordinance and they find out about it later and they realize like hey I didn't get you know this information what recourse do residents have in the community um, if they realize you know a landlord violated the ordinance and then something that you said Mr. Persons you were talking about 
um, basically how it's creating an inventory of rental property. And I'm curious if Airbnbs are kind of like included in that stuff. They're, they're not. No, they're yeah. specifically exempted. Yeah. Um, yeah they are. That's yeah. a state preemption. By the state, state preemption. preemption. That's right. what I was wondering. I, I they got, like, preempt. Well right. I was wondering if it was preempted. Yeah. We get a lot of questions about what about Airbnbs, but uh, the city is, is, and cities in Florida are preempted from regulating Airbnbs. Um, and then to uh, to your point about the recourse, um, something that uh, that uh, we do is so there's a, a tenant bill of rights that was part of the original ordinance. Um, that's some of the material that goes out to um, uh, in the mail when we send it out. That's also going to be something that our inspectors are going to carry um, and be able to leave any uh, documentation with tenants because those are typically. Um, we see a lot of tenants who are there answering the door to do inspections. Um, there is, uh, I, I can talk maybe about, if you want me to talk about the, the, the sort of violation process, if that's, that would be helpful sure. in terms of, uh, I could so, be here all night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the way that the city's, uh, ordinance is essentially, um, so we have a regulated, you know, we'll have a regulated property. Um, the city will go out, do an inspection, an initial inspection. Let's say that inspection has deficiencies, meaning it, it fails inspection. Um, we give a period of time for that work to be completed and, and uh, the um, deficiencies to be fixed. Then we schedule a second inspection. We go out, we inspect again. Let's say there are still deficiencies. The landlord hasn't, hasn't fixed um, the issues that were uh, documented in the first um, first inspection. Um, at that point, the next step for the city under the ordinance is to actually start the code enforcement process, the formal code enforcement process, which would be we would issue a notice of violation to the owner. Um, they would have another period of time to, uh, to rectify the issue. If they still don't bring it into compliance, then we would schedule that before the city's special magistrate, which is basically like our uh, the person at the city who adjudicates all of the code enforcement violations. Um, at that point, if the magistrate uh, found the um, that the property you know had had been violating the ordinance, the rental ordinance, then uh, there would be fines assessed um, up to and including re uh, revocation of the uh, the rental permit. So the ability of the uh, the um, landlord to rent the property if it wasn't uh, in compliance. And so there, there are a couple other remedies that we have as well, but um, but that's the general process of the city. Cool. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. So that is something that um, we will, uh, if we do get a complaint on a rental property, even though we are by the city's ordinance inspecting um, every unit on a rolling f uh, or random uh, four-year basis. If we do get an, an, an actual complaint from a tenant, we will go out and do an inspection proactively and enter them into our system. Thanks, Missy. And I would say, I mean, contacting the, I guess, what's the name of the department that's not? I guess it's, yeah, the, contacting them. I don't know, the ones under that, the ones running the renters. Oh, code enforcement. Code, code enforcement, yeah, code enforcement. Um, having them contact them if they feel like they've, Something's been off, but just one thing: the the housing scores. Not everyone has one because we've only done one year's worth of inspections. Right. So, seventy five percent of the units out there don't have a housing score yet. Um, so they can't give one if they don't have one yet. So they are they are exempted. If they have one, they have to give it. If they don't, they don't have to give it. So. And, and those those scores are going to be updated on an eight year basis. But we're we're going ahead and doing the energy efficiency scores with this first round, first four year round of inspections. Sort of somewhat un unrelated, but maybe you have these figures off the top of your head. I was just wondering if you know how many Airbnb units are in Gainesville. We don't. There's not really a great way um, uh, to to track those. I know the the county's got a voluntary registration um, program. What's that? So the, the TDC actually, um, or the, the Tourist Development Department of the county does track that, um, and they are uh, collecting um, that from Airbnbs. I think they have a, a private company that's tracking it and looking at the Airbnb websites. Um, so anything that's under 30 days, including if you're renting for under 30 days, is considered a, a hotel, and they're run under, or regulated under, under hotel state statutes. But I think it's 2,000 two maybe, or 
I think I, I, I've, I had the report come to bed. I don't remember exactly what okay. the number well, is. It's, but it's a, li it's a little messy. The state yes. law is a little yeah. fuzzy. And they, yeah. this past legislative session, they they tried to make Airbnb regulations more concrete and standardized across the state. It failed, uh, but it will be coming back in the next legislative session. So if you guys are interested in this issue, and I personally think it's a big issue, um, rental unit or rentals, uh, units being taken out of rental stock and turned into Airbnbs, um, there is an opportunity to fight to get the uh, local preemption repealed, right? Because they do want to regulate Airbnb, surprisingly. Um, so there is a window for us at the state legislative uh, level to repeal that uh, in the next legislative session. Yeah, it always seems so, sort of schizophrenic because we have we have competing bills, one to you know to further preempt, and then one to to uh, to regulate or to to remove preemption. I'm so glad that you're bringing this in house. Um, I am a landlord. I got inspected by CAP. It was a terrible experience. <laughs> um, I had just gotten the old porch demolished. The brand new double pane Pella windows were stacked in the carport, and they they Vi said I was doing all this horrible stuff with exposed and rotting wood and blah, blah. And there was, to have things on the um, inspector's car would be great because there was a three-inch piece of pipe coming out of the hot water heater that had been overlooked. Everything else was insulated for five feet. And so if it were on the truck, you know, you could just do it right then. Um, and the other thing was they didn't tell me how to fix what was wrong at all. So I had, I tried to find out I'm getting reinspected tomorrow and I thought it was going to be in house, but it's cap. So I just, <laughs> I'm on pins and needles yeah. tonight <laughs> about what to do because I, I'm trying to do, you know, I have a, a brand new AC, brand new hot water, brand new porch, brand new double pane windows, insulation, the whole nine yards, and and what they pro portrayed in the report did not match what my unit is like. I don't, I don't so. want to see you at the magistrate. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I said it was a bunch of college kids. So. Yeah. Yeah. So what? Is, maybe y'all could talk. At, Afterwards, yeah, we we are um, so from the city side. So we've been um, doing uh, recruitment since the commission gave us uh, direction to end the cap contract and go in house. We have um, three uh, three officers right now. One is a supervisor um, that uh, have building background and they're they're um, they're being trained. They're actually doing some of the reinspections. Um, CAP's contract is officially uh, ending at the end of September with the fiscal year of the city, at which point then we're going to be doing all of the inspections moving forward. So um, hopefully, but, uh, but yeah, follow up with me, Nancy, if, if, uh, if anything goes wrong. I will follow up. <laughs> <laughs> and not at the magistrate. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know you all said that because of state laws, uh, comp apartment complexes with like five or more units are exempt from being um, inspected and from these regulations. I just wanted to know if there's any like state level regulations um, like regulating these complexes and if they if there are, like how do they stack up against this new city ordinance that got passed? Do you know off the top of your head? They're, they're regulated as, as uh, rooming houses basically under the, um, under the apartment uh, section of, of state law. Yeah. We also do, we do fire inspections. So we do, we can regulate, or we can, we do inspect under fire. Um, so our fire inspectors do go up for them. Um, I'm not sure on the, they're really, I mean, yeah, there's not, PR, I don't know if you know more, yeah. We, um, yeah, Harold can speak to this. It's his department, but we do minimum housing on those units now. So the county is still looking into the preemption, but for now we're going to keep it with the four and under for sure if it gets adopted. 
because we need to get the program going and that would just be adding so many more but we do do minimum housing today on units that are over four and still would when the when the minimum housing code is updated so, so sorry does that mean it's possibly like printed only for cities i think that's mm -hmm. Come to, I'll give you some I guess speak to this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I disagree with the idea that it's preempted at all. Uh, in South Florida, if you look at Broward County, several cities in Broward County, Palm Beach County, the city of West Palm Beach, Dade County, they have rental licensing programs that date back for decades, and it's not limited to four unit buildings and below. When you read chapter 509, which is what is being stated as being what preempts us, it's talking about not allowing you locally to regulate things that are regulated by the Department of Hotels and Restaurants. But it's not very well written, and I believe it's being misinterpreted to say that you can't do those. But I could take you to any of those other counties and they are, in fact, doing it. I don't care. I had buildings that had 100 units in it, and they had a license with us, and we did 100 units. It, it's, it's, um, it was a decision that was made, I assume, by attorneys up here that they were preempted. And, uh, and I think that was probably done at the city level, and the yeah. county level is, you know, uh, following that. And basically, I disagree with it, I, and, but, we, but as Missy said, we still, if you have a problem and you live in a five unit or an eight unit building, we still have the same code applies to the unit and we will do inspections and site violations. But what we're missing is that database that was referred to. We're not building it on that. And when you look at some of the areas that have uh, low income housing, the swag area on the other side of the interstate, most of the buildings are eight unit buildings. So we're gonna say in an area that once was considered blighted that we've put a lot of effort, a lot of investment into, new roads, new parks, daycare centers, all of these things, we're not gonna hold them to this licensing ordinance, but we'll go after Greta because she rents out two units, you know, <laughs> or something like that. that. There seems to be an inequity there Housing is housing. It's a major industry. It, it's more than 40% of the units in this county are rental. Only 55 or so percent are owner occupied, and that needs to be regulated. And uh, like I said, there, this has been going on for decades in other counties, and we're kind of actually catching up. The energy stuff is much newer. They, they don't necessarily do those things. But as far as a minimum housing code and doing inspections, that's been going on for a while. Thank you. So I think we have to, y'all can talk to the panelists after. We try to end by eight and we have a couple other things. And um, September 13th, this comes before the county, right, Mary Helen? Do you happen to know what time? I would urge all of y'all to come and testify and write letters about how important you think it is, and then we'll try to get the county attorney to help us get to where we can regulate above four. Yeah, and right, and right now, I will say I'm checking the county agenda every other day, so when it pops up, I'll be sure to post it on our Instagram and our Facebook, so if you can follow us on social media, and you'll be able to know um, when on September 13th the county will be um, hearing this ordinance. It has been advertised for the daytime. The county Commission doesn't know that yet. That's, that's before they get it. Oh, okay. So it will be during the day at the 1130 meeting at some point. The agenda will come out next, at the end of next week. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come out and talk to correct the record after, uh, you know, what was printed in the Gainesville Sun. I think this cleared up a lot of, uh, you know, questions that a lot of us had. And uh, thank you so much for all the work that you guys have done and continue to do. And um, thank you, Sheila, for having all these amazing questions after that article. Okay, so uh, we're going to go ahead and finish up. We're, uh, we are approaching the end of our meeting.